Blog Talk Radio. This is Lori Smith. I'm glad to be here. This is One Child to Be a Survivor to Another Restoration. Haven't been on for a while. Took the holidays off, actually. Took a whole month off. <laughs> Sorry about that. I wasn't planning on taking a whole month off, but I, I was tired and busy, and I thought, well, I'll just get to it in the, in the new year. So happy new year to everybody. And hopefully you're all doing well, and the new year's starting out well for you. We're looking at boundary issues, and mainly from information from Hovoka.org right now. That's what we're going to continue on with till we finish it up, probably just another show or two, and then um, move on from there. So I appreciate everybody who's taking the time to listen to my shows. You know, people are still listening, and that's awesome. I've been on here almost 10 years now. Um, it'll be 10 years in November. I started in November 2009 doing these blog talk shows. I had no idea how long I'd be doing them, and I've done over a 1,000 shows. Like, uh, it's an amazing amount of shows, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, I had a lot to say, so obviously, but I appreciate everybody who's taking the time to tune in. I do have the chat room open there if anybody wants to sit in there tonight, or sometimes I don't have that open, and it is open, so if anybody wants to head in there, you can. Um, yeah, so if you're a survivor, and you're listening, and you're, you know, not sure if you'd be safe enough to listen, and this might bother you, you need to get that information, you know, find out what it is, you know, to be safe, like, and to know whether you're safe enough to listen. So if you're a survivor of abuse, you know, this kind of information can trigger you. So you have to, you don't want to go backward in your healing journey. So you need to get that information. You can find that from uh, many places, but um, the ASCA, Adult Survivors of Child Abuse, a Morris Center program, they have a workbook called um, Survivor to Thriver. And uh, it's a great manual. It's free. You can grab it right on their website. And um, the first chapter is called Safety First, and that's where I first learned about safety information. So you can get that information for free. Check it out and read it. It's very important that you don't be triggered and go backward in your healing journey. So if you're a survivor of abuse and you're listening to this or, you know, you have any, you might feel like it might bother you, um, you need to just turn the show off and go get that information first. Make sure that you're safe enough before you listen to something like anything like this, my show or anybody else's show dealing with topics of abuse uh, of any type because you don't want to be triggered and then go backward in your healing journey and have a miserable day and hurt somebody else or hurt yourself or, you know, it's just, you need to be safe. So if you're not sure, turn the show off and go get that information and read it and make sure that you understand how to be safe and how to know whether you're safe enough. And anybody else who's listening, you know, you have to listen at your own discretion because I'm talking about abuse. This is not a comfortable topic at all. It's not, it's not, you know, good uh, coffee table chat material <laughs> for, you know, for for regular folks. This is, I'm talking about abuse and horrific stuff. So, you know, if you think that this might bother you, you have to be the best judge of that for yourself, right? And make sure that you're okay. Otherwise, just turn the show off. You won't be bothering me at all. And if you're anybody else, if you're a minor under the age of 18, I ask that you have parental consent or an adult consent to listen to this. Have somebody else, an adult 
listen to it first to make sure that it's age appropriate for you. And then, you know, they can help you decide and make the decision on whether you should be listening. Because ultimately, this is about child abuse. But this is about adult survivor issues, this show. And, and there's a lot of very sensitive material here that many young people may not have heard about or, you know, just could be sort of um, disconcerting. So you need to make sure that you keep yourself safe, right? So I ask everybody to just listen at your own discretion and make the right choices for yourself, right? So we're going to get right into this article here. This is from Havoka. I'm not going to go back and repeat the last information from the last show. You can just go listen to that. I, I, that's been a month since I've done a show. It's a long time. But <laughs> I haven't done any work on this for a month because it was holiday, you know, Christmas holiday and, and New Year's and I was busy and and doing other things. So I haven't done any work. And so that's why I'm glad to be here, glad to get back into this because I need to keep going. And this is part of my healing journey. You know, I'm working through things all the time. And this is very helpful for, it shows me where I'm at in my healing journey. So hopefully it's helpful for you too. So you can go back and listen to that last show. We're talking about boundaries. It's called Help for Adult Victims of Child Abuse at Havoka.org. Information for Survivors. The actual article is called Personal Boundaries. And uh, we've done a few shows now, at least three on this so far. So we'll pick up where we left off. This uh, person who's writing this article for Havoka goes on to say, I was not able to start seeing myself as separate in a healthy way. Um, in parentheses, they have written, I had always felt that I was separate in an unhealthy way, shameful and unworthy. And then they said, until I started to see that I had been powerless over the behavior patterns I learned in childhood. And since my behavior patterns, my behavioral and emotional defense systems had developed in reaction to the feeling that there was something wrong with me, I had to learn to start taking power away from the toxic shame that is at the core of this disease. So this person writes, the toxic shame involves thinking that there is something wrong with who we are. Guilt, in in their definition, she says, or whoever this person is writing this article, guilt in my definition, this is their definition, involves behavior while shame is about being or being. So guilt is I did something wrong. I made a mistake. Shame is, I'm a mistake. Something is wrong with me. I find this article very interesting. See, this person brings up some very uh, heavy stuff, actually, for, for for people who have dealt with any of this stuff. You know, this stuff just shouts at me from the page. Um, just, you know, shouts very loudly. I actually identify with a lot of it and understand, you know, where she's coming from, or he, he or she, whoever wrote this article. I'm not sure if it's a woman, but I think it is because there's a, quite a few of the articles are written by a particular woman, but I can't remember her name. But uh, this is from Havoka.org. So I guess what we'll do is we'll just talk about this one for a bit, and then we'll see if we have time to move on to the next section. But this is so um, harsh for survivors of abuse, um, you know, any type of abuse in, in any way, right? But I'm talking about child abuse mainly because that's what I'm dealing with here on this show. But like she said, you know, these behavioral patterns that she learned in childhood um, until she saw that they were, that she she really was powerless over these, over these learned behaviors from her childhood. It really wasn't her fault. Um, it, well, she wasn't able to start sort of separating um, herself like in a healthy way from the unhealthy way that she had been, you know, always seeing herself and always feeling this shame and this unworthiness, right? She wasn't able to see that until she realized they were behavior patterns that she learned learned behavior patterns. So that's kind of that's so true, you know. For I started to pick that up, especially reading, um, like I said in the last show, John Bradshaw's books and um, Robert Burney, The Dance of Wounded Souls, uh, Codependency, The Dance of Wounded Souls. Um, those are two great books and about codependency and boundary issues and whatnot. I really didn't know they had all these learned behavioral. Uh, patterns and ways of thinking I just thought that you know I just didn't even realize that that they were learned from in my very toxic upbringing and that I was going to have to do something about them and when I started my healing journey back in 2007 I really didn't do any work till 2009 so I did a little bit mainly uh, oh I don't know Um, I didn't do any real work on the child abuse stuff I just worked on uh, my my current situation at the time, which was to try to stay alive and not commit suicide, and also to um, 
start um, trying to have a more positive outlook on life and try to see things in a different way, which was great. But I didn't do any of the work until 2009 when I started looking in at all this stuff. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, there's I've been dealing with things based on my childhood. I'm, I'm letting my inner child rule, the, you know, make the decisions in my life. And that inner child is wounded. So <laughs> this is not a good thing. Um, you know, this this whole situation of these behavior patterns that we pick up along the way. And I mean, everybody picks up some stuff that's probably unhealthy along the way, but especially abuse survivors. And so this person says, since my behavior patterns, my behavioral and emotional defense systems had developed in reaction to the feeling that there was something wrong with, with me, she, this person says, I had to learn to start taking power away from the toxic shame that was that, that's at the core of this disease, right? This toxic shame involving thinking that there's something wrong with who we are or who I am, right? And that's a huge issue. I know for myself, like toxic shame, um, I didn't even think I had any shame because I never took blame on. I know a lot of survivors, and I've talked to so many survivors over the years, over the last 10 years, almost 10 years now, um, who, and even before that, because I knew people who were abused, but we never really discussed this stuff like that, but just things you pick up from people, um, you know, that so many times people who've been abused will take on that blame as if, you know, because their abusers probably, you know, may have, maybe not, but may have implied it or just come out and actually said it, that the abuse was, was their fault. And uh, they were, their, their behavior was causing them to, to be abused or whatever the situation is. Or that if they weren't so this or that, um, you know, I know for in my own, I mean, I really can only speak for myself, like growing up, I always felt there was something wrong with me. But that's because it was, it was really, um, I guess, fortified. <laughs> we'll just say that was just fortified and solidified within me because my, that's how my parents treated me. But my parents were psychologically and 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 mentally unwell, so they didn't treat anybody well except for people they were trying to manipulate, which was neighbors, friends, you know, people that they wanted, uh, their own friends, their their adult friends. They didn't treat them horribly, right? But they they treat each other terribly and their children. So I grew up believing there was something wrong with me. And there really was something wrong with me. But it wasn't me that was the problem. It was just what they did to me that was wrong. So I never took the, the shame or the blame on because I knew that it wasn't my fault that that my parents were fighting all the time. When I was young and I was growing up and I was this little kid listening to my parents fighting and breaking things and hurting each other. I mean, it wasn't just my dad, you know, just abusing my mom all the time. My mom would fight back and hurt him, and they would hurt each other. It was absolutely horrific. And they would trash the house and bust things and, you know, broken glass, broken dishes, blood, you know. But they were terrible. And I knew that wasn't my fault. You know, I knew they were they were just having, they were just, they well, actually, they made it very plain that they hated each other. <laughs> I don't know why they stayed together, but they did. But, um you know, growing up, I didn't take that blame on for that. Um, but my mom, separately, I didn't care about my dad because I didn't care about him at all. Um, when I was a young child, I didn't have any relationship with my dad. And my dad was just abusing the family anyway, so I didn't have any respect for him. And he was abusing all of the siblings, including and my mother, so and, and including me. And I didn't really have any respect for him. And he tried to kill me and my sister a couple of times and and uh, threatened to kill himself many times. I was just like, you know, I felt sorry for him in a way when I got older. When I was little, I was just, uh, I was actually fear. I was afraid that he would kill me and, um, or, you know, that he would kill us all because he had been threatening to do that for so long. But then when I got older, I realized he was just so messed up, you know, so psychologically unwell. And I just thought, well, I kind of felt bad for him, you know, a little bit. I felt like sort of sorry for him because he was just so messed up. But I didn't care what he thought of me because I didn't care about his opinion whatsoever. But my mother was a different story. My mother was my main abuser, but I loved her. You know, my mother, really. And-
And um, so it, it was sort of different with my mom. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what that little beeping was, but whatever it was. Hopefully I'm streaming properly and you can hear me. Um, but anyway, that took huge toll on me was her, with her opinion of me, which made me then take on a lot of this toxic shame, um, which started very young because I knew that she didn't want me. I was not a wanted child. I wasn't wanted. Um, she made it very plain and clear that I wasn't wanted. So that was a big deal. And then uh, that I was born out of rape, you know, um, marital rape. And also that I was just so much trouble and I was causing her so much grief all the time, which I wasn't doing anything but being a normal little kid, right? But I wasn't getting any direction and I didn't have any upbringing really. I just kind of brought myself up. So <clears throat> she wouldn't have anything to do with me. So I kind of, I, I felt like uh, ostracized, you know, by her. Um, she treated, she would, depending on the day, would treat people differently for to get her needs met, right? Um, that's just how she operated, but it was, uh, I did take on a lot of toxic shame because of that. And then the CSA child sexual abuse, when I was eight, that really caused an, another whole set of problems with, uh, toxic shame, but I didn't take the blame on same. So I didn't think I had any shame because I didn't take the blame. I, I didn't say, Oh, I deserved it. I must've been, I was such a horrible child that I actually deserved what I got. I never deserved any one of those beatings that I took from my mother or my dad. And I didn't obviously deserve the child sexual abuse, but my mother told me that I was just this horrible kid. I didn't deserve to live. She would call me names. Um, you know, not only did she beat on but she loved to get her digs in, like especially with sort of a scapegoat, like a a com like an easy target for her, you know, problem. <laughs> so when I got older, I started staying away from the house quite a bit and, uh, you know, avoiding her. But when I was really little, you know, I was around the house and I took a lot of abuse from her. And, uh, for, you know, I didn't think that it bothered me. I didn't think, I didn't think that I had so, so many problems with it uh, until I got older. Then I realized like, oh my God, like my whole view, still alive that I'm alive on the planet you know I was made to feel bad about that I should have died I should I should have been born stillborn this is the kind of stuff that she would tell me when I was young especially really when I was little and that I was just this rape child that she didn't want and why didn't I die with the other two that were born stillborn and I should have never lived and she should have just killed me when when I was when I was in diapers she did she should have just killed me stuff like this she was uh, just a mean horrible woman taking her frustrations out on me which is really pathetic. I don't give her any room for excuse there. I don't care that she was being abused or, you know, that does not qualify <laughs> what she did for me, that, what she did to me. That doesn't qualify. Like, it, does, it doesn't take away from what she did. So, no, you know, I mean, I don't excuse my mother's behavior at all, even though she was really screwed up because she was abused herself as a child by a horrific woman, my grandmother, who was just terrible, her mother, and also uh, then then uh, spent years with this a man who abused her, her husband, my dad. So it's not that I don't have him. She still went ahead and let... Um, the relationship that she had with me continued to continue on all the way through, even though she knew what she was doing was wrong. And that when she knew she was destroying me, but she didn't care. So that's why my feelings are the way they are. You know, I mean, I don't just sit there and, Oh, I forgive you. And, you know, put it all in the past. It's okay. No, no, it's not okay. It's not okay at all. be it'll never be able to be made right none of it this the csa child sexual abuse i mean there's no way you can take that stuff back it's just done right so then i had to learn how to start seeing myself differently because i was like wow you know 42 years old starting out on my healing journey i didn't really do any real work on it till the age of 44 and i'm like good lord i need help because this is
I, I thought, well, first, I didn't really think about killing myself when I was 10. I was hoping that my mom would kill me. One of those beatings would just take me out. Basically, that's what it was. But then I got older and I started thinking, no, I mean, I could take myself out, <laughs> you know. And I mean, my family was suicidal. So this was just part of my daily routine. And, um, you know, just horrific, absolutely horrific. So then I hit 44 and I'm like, oh, man, no, I need to live. I got to learn how to do this. And I need to change the way I feel about myself. I can never change what happened to me in, in the past. I can't change any of that. And I don't, I'm not in denial. I couldn't even be in denial if I wanted to be. I'm just not, you know, it's just, it's just what it is. So I have to face this stuff, right? And I thought, well, okay, I need to change the way I feel about myself because obviously I did not do that stuff, that stuff to myself. And there's, I couldn't even be bad enough to be treated the way that she treated me or even my dad, but especially my mom. I mean, how could I, there's no, there's, that's, abuse is not about discipline. That's not the same thing at all. So the issue is, is it's pretty pathetic and sick what people do to children. But, you know, I'm stuck with the aftermath. And I'm thinking, I got to start seeing the big picture and what they did to me and take a look at the my feelings and the way that I feel about myself and, you know, go from there. behaviors and that really unhealthy way of this 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 toxic shame and 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 guilt and whatnot that that this, that, that she took on that's what I had to do was start saying wow none of this was my fault none of it and all the all the stuff that I was, all the unhealthy behavioral patterns that I had growing up were just learned uh, behavioral patterns because of the toxic uh, childhood that I had, right? This very unhealthy, abusive, um, I call it evil childhood that I had. So I started to think, well, the only thing I can do is see myself differently. And it's been a a journey like 10 years and I'm still working on it. I'm in a lot better place than I ever have been. I tell you that, but that's because I work on it all the time. Like I didn't, we haven't worked on this article here, but I every day have to go through a series of some sort of thoughts regarding something that's come up um, that tells me that I'm not good enough, that I'm just that loser that I used to be, that I'm just this, uh, you know, unwanted person on the planet. Nobody cares about me and, and which is, I mean, basically true. I have a few friends who care about me, but my family does not care about me. And so I have to care about myself. It doesn't matter whether anybody else cares about me or not. When it comes down to it, I have to care about myself. See, I, you can, I could never, ever get what I needed, ever, from anybody else. And that's just so true. I couldn't get what I needed from my mother, which was love and care and concern, compassion, you know, help, <laughs> safety. I couldn't get any of that from her. Couldn't get that from my dad. None of my siblings were looking out for me and some of them abused me. So, you know, one sexually, right? So, you know, I couldn't get anything from my family, period, as a child. And growing up, then as a teen, I couldn't get anything from them. I couldn't get any of my needs met from them. You know, I turned to drugs. I turned to my friends. I turned to the streets, basically, and just kind of hung around, you know, sort of hanging around the house, making sure my mom was okay, basically. And never got anything that I needed. So I had to start really late in life. Like, I mean, finally, I wish I would have started much younger. Like I said, on on many shows here, going back to 2009, (laughs) I wish that I had started years ago, you know, in my 20s or something, right, working on this stuff. But I didn't start till the age of 44. And when I hit kind of rock bottom there, so, but I'm glad at least I got started, right? It's better than not getting started at all. And I mean, there's good information out there for for anybody who's listening to this and just getting started and not sure like where to go. Like, oh boy, what am I facing? You know, there's it's a lot of work. I would say not to do it on your own. I've had a lot of support uh, working through this stuff, not just on my own. And so I would suggest getting into. Like I always say on most of my shows, you know, anonymous group support, that's helpful. They don't know your name. You don't have to give your real name. And it's anonymous, you know, and you can talk to people and people, the people that have been there 
through similar experiences, nobody's been through the exact same thing, but something we all share in common is that we're abused, right? And so we're survivors. There's a commonality there, right? And these are people that know how, how badly it hurts and how hard it is to come from that, you know, to be abused as a child and to have to try to make it in the world. It's very, very difficult because it's not like we have supportive family around. <laughs> this is the whole idea about child abuse is that there's no family. Even if there is a family, it's generally toxic and destructive. And, you know, I finally got away from the age of 30, thankfully. You know, but I didn't cut ties with them all until, oh, I don't know. It's been a while now, but I finally did cut them all completely off. Like, no, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to have a good life. That means I have to separate myself, right? But that's part of that whole boundary issue. And that's kind of what we're talking about. But we'll pick up the next part of this um, next Monday. And I'm thinking about changing the time to 9 o'clock instead of 10 o'clock p.m. Um, instead of so late, I'm going to change it to nine because I can do the show at nine. I think it'll be I'll, I'll be more apt to do it and stick with it. So that's my new goal is to show up here next Monday <laughs> and uh, pick up where we left off. So, yeah, we've only got a few minutes left here. I think. Let me see. Yeah, three minutes. That's not too long. But um, I appreciate everybody's taking the time to listen. And like I say, I'm, I'm hoping you're getting something out of this. And you know, I would say whatever it is, you have to find that that fight within you, that strength within you somehow, you know, to keep going. Because there's days that are really hard, you know. Some days are better than others, but I mean, sometimes it is so difficult to continue on this path, but you know what? Everybody else is fighting something anyway. It seems to me that this is what this life is really all about. There's good days and there's bad days. i just be happy for the good days and And those bad days, you need to find somebody or find something within yourself that says, you know what, I can do this. For me, it's a drive. It's a drive to um, not allow myself to be destroyed by what my abusers wanted to, to use to destroy me. You know, so all of the abuse, the beatings, the the sexual abuse, all of it, all of the scars and the the fact that they messed my life up for, for good for real, causing me to be barren and, you know, all kinds of problems with my body and all kinds of problems with my mind and my heart, you know, they tried to destroy me. So my goal is to fight that and to not be destroyed by the abuse and to allow myself to have win it. I'm the one that wins. And it's true. My abusers are dead, and I'm walking uh, in a in a. I'm walking towards healing. So that's what I wish for you, that you would not give up ever. If you're listening to the sound of my voice, man, I'm telling you, you do not give up. You call a crisis line if you have to. You call somebody, but there's people out there that are, that do care and they do want to help. But you have to look for them. You know, nobody's just gonna come knocking on your door asking if you want some help. You need to reach out, and you need to get help. And if you need more information, contact me. Contact NASCA, National Association of Adult Survivors of Child Abuse. I'm the Alberta Ambassador for NASCA.org. Go to that website. Call. You can talk to people. But whatever you do, get help, right? Talk to you next week. Take good care of yourselves. Until next time, bye-bye.